Okay, I think we'll start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Open Data Institute. My name is Anna Scott. I'm the editor here, and I'm delighted to have Michael Weatherburn here from Imperial College to talk about bringing ghost data back from the dead. Uh, so it promises to be a really interesting talk. There'll be some time for discussion at the end and questions. Um, the hashtag is ODI Fridays if you'd like to join the conversation online. And for those watching online, you can ask questions using the hashtag on Twitter, and we'll ask them at the end as well. Okay, over to you. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> it's great to be here at the Open Data Institute Friday uh, lunchtime lecture to tell you about bringing ghost data back from the dead. Um, it's a special day to be doing this. We will have President Donald Trump in a few hours, I think. So think of this project as kind of making data uh, great again. Um, that's, uh, um, but something else I'm making great, uh, great again, in addition to my day job at Imperial College, um, I'm launching a new startup. It's great to be here in startup land to, to do it. I launched it on Monday, actually, called Project Hindsight. Uh, me and about 10 uh, associates, all of whom have uh, PhDs, um, and that promises to be really good. And what I'm doing here is telling you about the work uh, I and others uh, within that group have been doing over the past year or so um, to, to get our old data back and make it useful. And then I look forward to hearing what, what we can tell you about, uh, what would you find uh, useful. Um, but yeah, as I say, we're making something else great again. The, the name comes from this uh, older military program from the 1960s. Uh, long now finished, so uh, we, didn't, we felt it was a, an homage to that. Um, this was an enormous program undertaken by the US military in the 1960s. Um, the research, it took 13 teams of scientists uh, spanned 40 man years, so uh, across a smaller period, but 40 years in total, and looked at the annual expenditure US uh, defense budget, uh, some of it, of 300 to 400 million uh, dollars, and adjusting for inflation, that's about two to three billion dollars now. Um, they examined enormous quantities of past data from their scientific researches, um, all kinds of stuff on expenditure, costing, testing data, uh, performance data, you, all this stuff on engine turbines and all this kind of so on. outcomes, how quickly they were, uh, projects were rolled out and all of this accumulating into one uh, massive data set that then they could finally um, make some conclusions from. Although they could not, as I will explain, uh, they were not able to then project forward into the future, i.e. to now, um, and look at things like maintenance, decommissioning, and disposal, all of which produce additional data on top of that, that body that they accumulated. The one conclusion they came to, which is really interesting, is that the majority of defense expenditure um, was in uh, the, the most useful uh, defense expenditure was in technology development rather than basic research. And then this directly influenced the military's future funding and research and development strategy. And we thought, well, that's really interesting. Um, we've done research like that, so let's get that spirit going again for the, the modern uh, age. So the, uh, what I'm going to be telling you about today stems from two aspects of consultancy work I and, and the group have been doing over the past two years. One, I've been working with a, a think tank called the Resolution Foundation, which I'm sure you have seen in all the newspapers, um, uh, where I'm, um, I'm a researcher in residence there, um, working on a project on the um, digitization of the workplace since 1990. And I'm going to tell you about how I, for the work's now finished, it'll hopefully be published quite soon. And I'm just going to tell you about how I did that research. Um, the other one is in the defense sector, uh, part of something called the Low Cost by Design Network out of Cranfield University. There's about five of us um, that we've been doing some consultancy work in, in the defense sector for the pr public sector and also the private sector. Um, so I'll talk a bit, I'll do a case study of what, uh, what I'm allowed to say anyway about what we were doing uh, in the defense sector there. Um, so they maybe sound, sound like different projects, but what the two things that they bring together are an, uh, an attempt, and hopefully a successful one, to um, get a, a long-term memory uh, of um, developments in that, those sectors. In the, the Resolution Foundation one goes back to 1990. The uh, defense project goes back to the 1930s. Um, and then we want to, this, these, this is being used then in effect by the client for future projections because they felt they didn't have a kind of memory and a, a data bank um, to draw off to, to make future uh, projections, as I would call it, turning hindsight into foresight. Um, so I'll break the talk down into two. One is what I call the corporate knowledge gap, um, which I found as part of this research, um, which I think is going to grow, uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And the second is what kind of data are we talking about, what is called in the, the slide uh, ghost data. Um, and what we can do about it. So I can help you 
uh, to improve your own institutional and corporate memory and knowledge and to tell you where you can find new uh, sets of data you can work with that will help you in whatever sector you happen to be uh, involved. Now, the subject of knowledge management um, and digitization, you can find plenty of specialists on this. Um, they're really interesting and useful people. I work with them uh, a lot. And I'm sure you will know what digitization means and probably the difference with digitalization, although if you don't, by all means, ask me that uh, at the end. Um, and it's been obvious for a long time that, that the uh, digital process will change our record keeping, it will, it will change our data storage, and it will change uh, what we're able to do with all of that uh, information. Um, so over the last 20, 25 years, there's been a great efforts to preserve all of the, the past data and that, to, that which is being developed as projects go on um, so that in the future here and even further so um, we will be able to, to use that. Um, and there have been also problems predicted in this process, uh, the, the emergence of digital. Um, the one which people have been worried about for a, a long time, ever since email came along, is that uh, political biographers of the future won't be able to write complete enough biographies of famous politicians. So, you know, what, what did Tony Blair write to Peter Mandelson in 2001 or something? Um, perhaps we would have had a letter in the past, now we might not because it was an email, perhaps it's been deleted. So that's been the issue we've known about the whole time and people have been trying to work with policies to make sure that doesn't happen because um, we ought to know about the process of government. Um, I'm talking now about the stuff that wasn't meant to happen, but has happened anyway. Uh, we can speak 10, 15 years on from much digitization processes. I can now report back some of the things, the issues that emerged, um, and what we can do about it. So I discovered that most it, differ, it differs between the public sector and the private sector for interesting reasons we can talk about. Um, most process, uh, most workplaces, in effect, institutions of many kinds that do any kind of work typically digitized around 2005 and 6, or fully digitized in 2005, 6. Some still don't, um, and that's a different issue I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, so we're talking about kind of a 10-year uh, period now, from then to now, where we've, that, that's a long time. And some people I've interviewed as part of these projects uh, had no, uh, no qualms uh, in realizing that there, there could be problems here. So I spoke to a, um, a what would we call a knowledge manager now, at a, 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 <coughs> a large, well-known automobile uh, producer um, who, incidentally, the guy had a PhD in history and he was converting all the project management processes from not quite paper, but the older formats to the newer digitized format. And he was very careful not just to digitize the process, but to make sure all of the old data was processed into the new system. So that company now still has its memory back to the year whenever, um, rather than 10 years ago, when some of them uh, now are finding they can't really work out what they, they were doing more than 10 years ago. So this is often called things like future-proofing. What I'm trying to argue here is we've heard about future-proofing for years. In some cases, it hasn't worked, and we need to know what to do about it. Um, so... This is the kind of thing we were talking about in 2005-06 when I, I, was a, uh, I was a student, come to think about it. So I was not remotely thinking about this at the time. Um, even the, I even selected old-looking pictures to make it just to imprint on you. This 10 years is, is, is a substantial amount of time, especially in the world of digital where things change uh, very much. So we've got loads of papers there converting to a PDF. That was what some people were suggested to do. That in retrospect, that was a very good suggestion. <clears throat> PDFs are still very readable, uh, very distributable. Um, but we can OCR them so they can be put, for example, in a kind of open data institute project so we can get at the, get at the information easily still. Great stuff. Um, if the stuff went into kind of digital format in these little folders, um, sure, we can probably read it. But as you will know, you're always updating your programs. You may change a computer. You may get a new one and just leave the old one with the stuff on it. Or you may keep the old data and, and the programs get updated. You can't read them. This has certainly happened uh, to me. Um, so there might be problems there if it was digitized into something else other than formats we still use. And of course, there's all kinds of compatibility issues between um, Microsoft, Mac, and, and so on, let alone then all the smartphones and all, all the, the apps we're developing for those. Perhaps the data doesn't correlate. 
that 10-year-old data won't work now. We don't know, or I do know in some cases, and it doesn't. Um, the other one, which is the so-called um, sort of nuclear power, nuclear power proof of CDs. Um, I know I don't have a CD player in my computer anymore. Uh, I have to go into the office to read a CD now. Um, and uh, so the scanning thing is very laborious, and it might have produced a bunch of CDs we don't really use anymore. Um, and even then, even then, again, the digital format might not be relevant to the present uh, software and skills, which is something I'm, I'm about to talk about it as well. So um, issues that have come up, and I'm not telling you anything you couldn't find out anyway. Um, the um, one thing that's happened over the past 10 years is teaching in universities has changed. People are not typically taught anymore to write or research or anything in paper. It's fine. It's cheaper. It's better for the environment and so on. And it, we don't really need much paper in the present day. However, in institutions that need to recover their corporate memory, corporate knowledge, the researchers are usually quite junior positions. So we now have lots of people in their 20s, maybe early 30s, um, who have been asked to do projects that, that go back beyond their, their time there. And they simply do not have the research skills or ability or knowledge management skills to look at the older stuff because they only know how to work in digital. Right? They're digital by default, as the phrase uh, goes. So that's, that's one challenge. The second challenge is that, as you can read in many newspaper stories, employment in many sectors has become flexibilized. This is an issue because if your records are not intact, the standard thing to do is you find someone who's been there, say, 20 years, and you ask them. Yeah? The data and the information might not be reliable. It may be reliable, but it gives you something to go on. If we have flexibilized our employment conditions over these past 10, maybe, maybe a bit longer, 20 years, um, it makes the, the physical human memory harder to, to access as well, um, which is a, another challenge that you may have encountered. Um, and a, a third one is that, and this relates most to the public sector for obvious reasons, um, the coalition governments of 2010 to 15, but in completely different ways depending on which section of the state, as it were, which public sector uh, organization, was rather rapacious in destroying old material. It sounded very modern at the time, and you, it's why would you have all these rooms full of paper in Whitehall where the land is very expensive. But in some cases, that was maybe the only record of the stuff. It wasn't digitized in the first place and now has been thrown out. Right? And I'm, I do have a message of optimism here. If that's happened to whatever you're studying, there is other places you can go to, as I have been doing for the past year, uh, with, I think, great success, uh, I'm told, um, to, to really help with that. And um, just anecdotally, um, sometimes the corporate knowledge and memory gap is even shorter than 10 years. One person I was interviewing in a section of the public, of the National Health Service, the NHS, uh, said that in his field, which is mental health care, the records now only have a memory of five years. So uh, when he's trying to find out the pharmaceutical requirements of the patients, if it's more than five years ago, he simply has to ask the patient themselves. Um, and that the people may not be able to remember or they might be confused or, or so on. Um, the names are so complicated anyway. Um, and simply when it comes down to it, I said, you know, what do you do if you, you don't, if the patient can't really give you the information you need, like the dosage uh, and this kind of thing, like, well, we just have to assume they're right or make a guess. Um, and so I really think we could, we could, uh, that this uh, issue extends to so many institutions. Some are great, some have uh, real issues with this, and some will, but they don't know it yet. So what kind of material am I talking about? I've got about five, six minutes left for some case studies. Um, the easiest one is if you have a private organization, like a company, or let's say like an institute like this, and you still have your old paperwork or your old um, software files, and you can just open them again. Sure, you'll have to acclimatize yourself to the context. Often, you know, We only have to be reminded in the past year how dramatically political, geopolitical events can change what we're doing and how we see things. So obviously, you have to contextualize uh, material. And Going back, especially, just trust me, if you go past the, back past the year 2000, uh, it looks like a very weird and wonderful world, especially because I can remember it. But I can't remember it because the world was actually different from how I experienced it uh, at the time. So companies and material, mat have their own materials. Great. Um, the one which you probably are less familiar with, I know some people watching this more in the academic world will be well familiar with this, 
Um, lots of material accumulates in, in the state archive, as it were. Um, this is uh, material we've been working on over the past year in the defense sector when we couldn't find the data, the material anywhere else. Um, and lo and behold, when people were writing things to each other, they would include, say, here's the stats for that project, by the way. Here's the costing projection for that. And then it would send uh, charts and, and data sets and so on. And we found them all and then can use that for building up this long-term um, knowledge of that uh, particular issue. And um, just so you know, you can get stuff going back to the early 1990s now uh, for free. You might have to actually go to Kew. Maybe it'll be online. Um, you can often do keyword searches just if you're after a very specific thing. Uh, that's fine. Um, the other one, which is the one, it sounds uh, rather pedestrian, but trust me, I use this very well. Um, this was for the Resolution Foundation. Um, old publications. Now, that, uh, I want, I'm not joking about this. One of the um, publications I was using was one called Logistics and Warehouse News. And it was actually Have I Got News for Yous, like comedy magazine of the month in November 5th, 2015. Um, but the reason why that was great is because I didn't have access. I was looking at the logistics sector because the internet entered logistics really, really early uh, in the early 1990s uh, compared to other sectors where it still hasn't internetized, as it were, like the care sector. Um, and I didn't have access to Amazon, which did exist then. D um, they don't have an ac accessible material to the public. Think about all the kind of corporate uh, privacy, secrecy, confidentiality issues here um, that you might have to engage. It was almost entirely private sector, the logistics sector. Yes, yes, we have. We have arrived. <laughs> um, it's almost entirely a private sector issue. Um, so we could say, well, we don't know, or we could phone people up. Um, what I did, actually, in this part of this research is got these journals, wrote to their editors, not these ones, but in the sectors I was looking at, wrote to the editors, said, this is what we're working on here. We want people who either remember or have access to old material. Um, so I was able to do several interviews in each sector I was looking at from people who were around since the 1990s. Um, and then also simply to sit down, obtain, sorry, obtain, sit down and read these magazines from cover to cover, build up a sense of knowledge of what has actually happened in that sector uh, from uh, the year 1990. And I was particularly interested, and our research was looking at this, um, when the internet entered each sector, and I can like signpost it now quite clearly over the last 25 years. You might be surprised how long that process took in some uh, sectors, or indeed how early other sectors did it from ones you're less uh, familiar with. Um, so, well, leave it to the pri previous slide. Um, what kind of data am I talking about here, right? Because some of you will be far better than me uh, statistics, I'm sure I can do regressions and things, but some of the really clever AI stuff I, I, I'm not a specialist in. Um, we're talking, one of the things that is very um, topical right now is how you create data, right? We've got sort of a quali qualitative world out there. How do we quantify what's going on so we can then use it um, in, in various uh, digital services, including uh, apps and so on? If the data is old, we need to consider its provenance, right? What you would do with a famous painting or something. Where, where, how is it, where has it come from? How long has it been there? Is it complete is the really important one because you don't want to build up modeling from incomplete data sets. Um, the other one is the data architecture. How is it stored? Um, how does that, and how does, as I mentioned, that storage method interact with newer equipment and uh, processing mechanisms? And to finish off with some case studies, I mean, I'm, I'm working on this, as I say, as it is. Um, this kind of approach is, I think, most relevant in, in sectors that have very long-term, very capital-intensive projects. Um, the ones I've been looking at, I'll mention defense in a minute to tell you what we were looking at. Um, Healthcare, because people live a really, really long time. Um, infrastructure, right? Roads are really old compared to some other things that we look at. Construction, buildings are designed to last many decades, and we need to remember, we want to know something about it. Uh, you can find this stuff, usually, um, even if it was a um, private sector project. And the one which is very topical, energy, right? A nuclear power station lasts, what, 40 years? Um, and I know there are problems now with the, the new nuclear commissioning we're doing is we don't know how to commission a nuclear power station in quite the same way as we would like, um, let alone having uh, data to use. So on the defense sector, which we were looking at, we've done two projects on that. You can look at them briefly on the internet. We, we were able to put some, some project titles down. Um, 
we were looking at issues to do with costing. Um, and for those intellectually interested in, in this kind of statistical modeling uh, world we live in, um, we were firstly trying to recover all the costing projections because we were interested in um, what's called slippage, right? So someone in 1950, for example, projected the cost would go like to whatever and they invariably draw a chart. Someone in 1960 invariably tries to do a similar chart and it's invariably completely different and normally more expensive and so on. And we were very interested in how uh, so we're trying to build up a new model of, in effect, can you predict how much slippage there is going to be in your costing projections? It's very topical. Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, is now talking a lot about the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, one of the world's most expensive projects ever undertaken, um, and talking about this. And we've been looking also about how the, um, the metrics changed over time. In 1935, all the metrics for costing were basically on how you develop an airframe. This is like the aeroplane bit. Yeah? That's where all the cost went. If you're do talking about it now, we know how to make an aeroplane. The cost now, you could find this out anywhere, the cost now goes into avionics mostly, right? the computer stuff. Um, and just uh, to say also something you, you need to make sure to familiarize yourself, as I've just mentioned, um, is terminology. You, you wouldn't be surprised how much terminology changes and how much we forget this. We talk about digital analytics all the time now, and so do I. Um, if you were looking back, if you really wanted to look back to the 60s or something, you can probably do it, but you would not find this term there at all. But it doesn't mean they weren't doing things with some kind of equipment. What you would look for is the budget for computing. Yeah? And then you would probably be able to find the like, percentage of budget on computing, and then you could build up a data chart on like, how much in our sector has um, computer and digital uh, taken up part of our costs. That would be an interesting project you could do. Um, and what's, what's, what else, how el what's lost money in the costing, uh, and so on. And that would be uh, really interesting. Um, and as I say, we can talk about that in many uh, sectors. So. Um, that's all from me. I really look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, have we got any questions? You mentioned uh, CDs. Yep. What is, the, what is the conceivable life of a manufactured CD, not one you do yourself, manufactured in the dark and in the dry? And what about the material on a hard disk, similar conditions, dark, dry? Uh, I must admit, I don't know, because this wasn't the material. I was just doing stuff with paper records. Do you, do you know, as a matter of interest? No, not very long, apparently, but I have no idea. I, I know that self-made CDs are redundant now. I'm sorry, that they, they've, it, it, they, all the stuff, all the coating's fallen off. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. I'm still, I, as I, I say, I, I launched think, this project on Monday. Yeah, Go I on. I don't think it's massive, which is why... Ten years, I would have said. Yeah. So into the mic. No, no, what I'm saying is I, I don't think it's very long because in a lot of these industries, they yep. still keep a lot of paper, warehouses full of paper. Yep, um, yeah. um, very expensive. They often out subcontract it yeah. as well, which in itself <laughs> is an expensive process. Yeah. Yes, please. So anyway, so I work exactly in, in this sector, so we'll have a chat later. Great. But um, so one of, one of the things you mentioned was data completeness. Yep. And so um, I'm just looking for your opinion. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's been overlooked um, in this hype, um, yep. big data hype. Mm -hmm that a lot of people go for the easy, fast, easy to get, mm -hmm. online mm -hmm. data, HTML, whatever is easy to get. But very few people want to tell the truth, basically, is what I'm saying, that in fact, there's a lot of data that is locked in some shape or form, mm -hmm. um, I mean, digitally, <laughs> yeah, locked yeah, 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 yeah. Um, unretrievable in boxes or whatever. Do, do you see a trend? Um, of, of, of actually experts and, and practitioners kind of then acknowledging that this is really the big problem now? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, we just, yeah, for the tape, we just ask <coughs> it, it, about data incompleteness. Um, people do worry about this, but I don't... It's very hard to convince people there's a serious problem. People will go, oh, well, okay, you know, maybe it's off by 5% or something. Um, so what I really like to do, I mean, well, it's not time for this now. I could do an hour talk on this, but... Um, is to look at the degradation of data over time. There are case studies I could give of you know, the creation of the data, often going back to the 1920s, for example, like labor productivity is 1920. Um, and looking at examples of how the data have 
in effect, uh, the incompleteness of the data in the first place have um, degraded over time and led to real problems. For example, there was a case study I did. I didn't do the, the interview because it was done in the 1990s, but I found the transcript, right? I literally need to find a bit of paper. Um, there was a guy who was saying that he was working at DuPont in the 1940s, and due to this kind of faulty labor budgeting system, which was incomplete in the first place, um, they had this massive warehouse with nothing in it. Now, why have you got this warehouse with nothing in it, they said. Um, and he said, well, you know, the data system tells us we have this room is full of stock, and we, we had to rig it back in the day to get the data right, and now they've given us a warehouse and they have no stock to put in it, so we have to invent this huge quantity of phantom stock. That was DuPont, right, a real big chemicals company. Um, so to answer your question, which is excellent, um, how, how I address this is by trying to provide case studies like this. I look forward to hearing whether they're convincing to people and what they do with them. Because we can't all do everything, leave you know, infinite time to develop the models, because then they're not useful and they're not relevant to people. Thank you. Um, we work with semantic technologies. And since they've been around since mid-2000s, mm -hmm. um, or 2000, 2003 started up, I wonder it, if it's worth us looking into the change in the semantics, in semantic coding even, in, uh, um, it's just, how did you, how did you figure out what the term was for something historically? Um, I didn't, but that's very interesting. I mean, my, my, what I was looking at um, it to do with the digitization project, it's much more contextualized, like the sort of social history, as it were, mm -hmm. how this affected people in their workplace. Um, it would be fast. You're absolutely right. That's re you've very cleverly expressed the kind of issue I'm raising, is the kind of internal uh, nature of the data and how it changes over time and evolves. Um, I agree. Uh, that's all I can say it's about that. Just it's, sort of a question yeah. that I think you you brought up yeah. Yeah, yeah. very well, and I hadn't heard mentioned before, but we might ought to start mm -hmm. thinking about it. Too. Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. Thanks. This is coming at a completely different sort of a level. Great. Um, <laughs> you mentioned earlier on that uh, an engagement you'd had with somebody in the mental health sector yep. where he was suggesting that a, a memory gap can be less than about 10 years old. So five he has years. A, five years. Yeah. Apologies, I wrote that down wrong. No if he has a client who cannot remember something yep. that happened longer ago than that, yep. uh, that's a problem. Have you done any research that looks at the relevant legislation or regulation covering effectively records management, data retention, in the, at the time in the sectors you're looking at? Uh -huh. So 10 years ago, there would have been records management legislation, regulation that that organization should have been adhering to. Have you, have you looked into that at all? That's um, no, it's really interesting. I was looking at, the, in effect, the kind of reality rather than the legislative uh, process. But you're absolutely right. And we, yeah, we also need to remember pe people don't always obey laws. Um, uh, do you mean because we could retrospectively prosecute people or something like that? No, not that you could retrospectively well, we could. prosecute. But, but, <laughs> but, but it's an if interesting yeah. concept that if people had done effectively what they were meant to do at the time, mm -hmm. we would be in a much different situation yep. now not only keeping things, but destroying things yep. that they should have destroyed that they've now kept. Uh, some of the best material I've found is stuff that says, you know, top secret, destroy after reading, or top secret, do not take home. And you find it in the person's personal stuff many, many, many years later. It's great stuff people keep. Yeah. A great question. Thank you very much. I, I look forward to exploring it. Just to add on that, uh, the Data Protection Act. Um, as far as I'm aware, the only sort of general legislation around this in terms of the medical records. So it would have been for the NHS to decide themselves what is the period of time for which data must be kept. As a per I'm not sure that there is any, and this is an internal NHS directive, but it, it's for organisations to determine how long they need to retain data for. And that's their data protection officers. This would sort of classically take the, the head role there of making sure that it's sufficient. Thank you. May I respond to that one as well? Um, I, it's, this is why, yes, that this, is, this is great. But, um, and what I'm, try, what I'm uh, saying is, in addition to, if we're trying to find the material and it's not there due to the policies of the institution, there are other ways into finding the stuff sometimes. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, how much do you see kind of like open data formats playing a role in 
like future proofing in the future. Like if a format is kind of like described, so you don't need the program in theory to, to look back at it. Like is that a solution or is that cause other problems? Um, well, so in some cases, I don't want to future proof the future. I just want to have the future. But um, <laughs> if that makes sense, yeah, you know, let's take some risk. But um, um, it's. I mean, what it would be useful for me, perhaps I'll write this up actually, is you know, if you think the stuff wasn't digitized, what, a kind of case study of about 10 years ago, um, you know, the digitization process, what worked and what didn't work, and I hope that would then feed into how people are trying to preserve the data and the modeling and the storage that we're doing now in this next wave of digitization, as it were. Does that answer your question? I might have a bit of an answer. Sorry, could you, would you mind waiting for the mic? Thank you. I might have a bit of an answer because um, well, that's how our software does that. Um, basically, structure PDFs and other documents. Um, over time, most of our customers used to define a data model that they would want their data to be in. But more and more, they're basically just asking us for an XML, mm -hmm. fully hierarchical XML. And that's kind of the, the base of what everybody's doing these days. And And then, Presumably, they'll keep it <laughs> as kind of the as a kind of the the source the source um, or the original data, and then they go do whatever they need to do, right? Um, content management systems or search engines and analytics, etc. But more and more, that's what they're asking us, and, and it didn't used to be like that. They used to kind of come down to like a very specific proprietary in-house kind of format, of uh, publishing formats yeah, and things yeah, yeah. like that. But now it's basically XML. Just give us the XML. So let's hope XML is a good storage so format. It's kind of like becoming just a, yeah, the common denominator. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that real quick. And I had a question about the magazines. But, uh, oh, sure. The thing I, I agree with you about the XML, the, the, um, the thing I think we don't think about is that that's based on most commonly UTF-8 encoding for text files. And while that's been a text files, ASCII has been around for 40 years and UTF-8... Um, 15, 10 or 15 years, that's, we're still, I think, like he's saying, making a leap to say that that's going to be here. In the blink of the eye of what you're studying, that's still a very small fragment of, and it wouldn't be unusual for someone to open an XML file encoded with UTF-8 encoded that everyone in this room can open right now and be inconceivable if we couldn't, but 100 years from now, uh -huh. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. On the magazines, I, I yeah, had a question. Yeah. Have you, are you coming across any issues where with the death of kind of modern printed journalism. Excellent. All right, well then I'll just let you go from there. Yeah. Great, <laughs> yes. Um, something I also didn't mention is, is there's an issue with, these were digitized around, around 2000, most trade journals were, were digitized. You can normally find online databases of the trade journals that go back to 2000. And very, they're normally quite low budget publications, so normally they have not digitalized, they're not the New York Times. They haven't digitalized their own paper copies of the past. So I had to, luckily for me, um, I have access to the Bodleian Library in Oxford, which is a copy, copyright library, but everyone here has access to the British Library, it's a copyright library. You can just get the stuff in there, that's what I did. And just sat down with stacks of these old things that people thought I was crazy looking at logistics and warehouse news and security times, which is kind of like about uh, like security, night security men in warehouses. But it got me the stuff, and yeah, you just need to go be able to find the paper copies. And I do find, uh, for an advert, you know, for the nation's libraries, we don't need to order them on eBay. We can just go and read them in the public uh, domain. I, I, that's exactly what I was asking. But I also I had this uh, side hobby of reading obituaries of magazines, last crying pleas of editors as their money ran out. And I actually had two discussions with some editors, probably one magazine you would know of, in the past few years. And I asked them, I said, where can I get an archive copy of all... I think it was like a seven-year run that magazine had, mm -hmm. and he said we don't we don't have we have print print line around the office, a couple stacks of old issues if we still have them, but there actually is they're all individual uh, files still the individual word files or whatever that the writers submitted to, and then the publication files, but there was never a a, a digital publication the way we tend to think of now of some of these magazines, and I was shocked to find that out, but of course when the money's running out, they're not about yeah. to spend. 100 grand to do that at the last few days. Yeah, and the, the other one that people, are, the, the one that, the related issue that people are surprised by is when there was never ever, a, for obvious reasons, a never a digital version of something ever created. They literally went onto paper and that's it. So, so you, um, that's fascinating in the publishing industry. 
when there's no... And, I mean, I've had this issue in, in the more academic side of things where the journal it may now be no longer existent and it, its name is, doesn't exist on the internet anywhere. So it may, and in this day and age, if it's not on the internet, it doesn't exist. So um, I, I, I mean that in a kind of uh, I, I, a sarcastic way. It does exist. Uh, we just need to work out where to get it. Um, but I'm really pleased you flagged that. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, just a kind of similar experience actually because I, I did this is really weird I did the Great South Run about 15 or 16 years ago and I got curious a couple of years ago thinking what time did I do how much slower was it what I do now there's nothing online and basically you just go I'll never find it out now. how would I find it out is there not an administration committee or something that, that sorts this stuff I don't know but it's just I one of those... OK, I'll, I'll those be more positive. There will, there will be some kind of running association there and they is. tend to accumulate the data, so ask them. But it's kind of, to your example in a way, yep. that you just assume if you find it online. Yeah. But something that's not even that long ago. I know. What year was that? It was about 15 years ago. OK, yeah, yeah. that d doesn't surprise me. But it, trust me, you'll be able to find it if you want. Mm. And if it was something slightly more... I don't say valuable. I'm not saying your time in the Great North Run isn't valuable. But if, it was, if you actually need it to run a battleship or something, this is the kind of thing I look at, then you would divert some energy into finding Absolutely. it. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. But it's exactly the same issue. And also, if it was a battleship, they're not going to put the stuff online because it's a military issue, yeah. right? So it, it's, it, again, with the private sector, private individuals and so on, versus uh, other types of organizations, you need to be aware of how to, to move through and around these, these issues. I think was Just a reminder to anyone online that you can ask questions via the hashtag. Uh, in the meantime, was there one over here? Yep. Yeah, we've got a question via Twitter from mm -hmm. Glyn R. Jones. Uh -huh. um, the idea of selecting papers for the national record used to make sense. Mm -hmm. Should we now keep everything produced digitally? Great question if we did. Um, I hmm, Let me think about it. Well, we don't keep all the paper stuff by a very long way already. Um, I also think, just thinking back over the past, well, I'm not 70 years old, but thinking over the past 70 years, what very striking thing has happened is the relative shrinking of the state and the rise of the private sector. Um, so, hmm. It would be difficult to also, well, okay, to actually answer the question, should we keep everything that's digital? Sure, why not? Um, or maybe we could just keep the digital versions of the paper stuff we're keeping right now. I mean, I, I don't know what the National Archives selection criteria is, uh, but I ought to find out. Thank you for the, to the person. But the thing I would also respond is, Perhaps the stuff in the public domain is becoming relatively less important than things you can get from private sources, which is why I was particularly keen on the Resolution Foundation project to work only in the private sector, because it was an interesting intellectual challenge to me. It's much harder to do. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I've got a related question. So Great. earlier you talked about um, how you can sort of plot where the internet sort of permeated different industries and how mm -hmm. that spanned a surprisingly long amount of time. Do you, what would you think the incentives were for, for those that were more attuned to it earlier as opposed to those who are not quite as keen? Great question. Um, normally to save money on something, but um, anything to do with sort of information management, people quickly realized it was a fantastic way of uh, organizing information, um, connecting banks of information to each other. So what we call... Um, inter, uh, intranets, you've got all these intranets everywhere, right? Um, and there are ways of, uh, if you could standardize the connection between the two, you could have more an internet, right? Um, but, yeah, I think that's, that's my answer. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, me again. Um, you, the point you just made about saving money and being uh, and information management being more straightforward, they are they can be mutually exclusive. Sure. So there are organisations, particularly I would suggest in the public sector, who in the early two thousands, as they do now, had a huge drive for saving money. 
Mm -hmm. So in order to release physical space, sure. they um, digitise lots of information in such a way that now they just can't find out what is inside those files. Sure. Um, and so the, the, I agree that there were those two drivers, but yep. there, there are circumstances where they're mutually exclusive. Sure, thank you. I, mean, I, I meant cost savings in a different way. Um, I mean to do things like reduce manpower, because um, if you can organise your logistics better, you don't need so many people driving around in trucks and things like that. You see what I mean? So thank you, yeah. Where do you see, uh, you said you want the future now, where do you see the future of your research? I mean, this could, this could be unending, yep. <coughs> but where, what are you hoping to get when the, must, when the funding runs out, where will you hope to be? Um, uh, the funding has run out, which is why I'm taking it to a private company. Um, I, um, it's, it's hard to do. I mean, it, from, one, from an intellectual perspective, Everyone who's studied something a lot wants other people to find it interesting and useful. So that one, personally satisfying. Um, I also think we live in this very, uh, um, uh, various people refer to quarterly capitalism, which is only planning four months in the future or three months or three months. Um, I think we do the same with our memory as well. We live in this very short-termist world that we're moving with sort of two months on each side. And just in my own small way, to try and get people thinking in a longer-termist way, both forwards and backwards, just because I think the world would be a better place if we did that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. I mean, it is, it's, it's interesting, and I think it could be useful to people. Have you ever had issues around sensitivity of data in terms of identifying people and need to anonymize and, um, in order to gain access, mm -hmm. anything along those lines? All the time, yeah. Um, depending on the sector, sometimes it's because I'm not writing about specific people, it's a very general sectoral shift, so it doesn't really matter that much. Um, when dealing with really sensitive uh, uh, types of material, yes, absolutely, you have to go into specific rooms to look at it, and people have to you know, check everything before they give it you, and then you can only present it in certain contexts, and only certain people are allowed to be there, and that kind of thing, yeah, definitely. They can all be navigated if you, if you know what you're doing and have enough willpower to do it. Um, it just can be, you, need, you do need quite certain um, skill set to be able to, to navigate this kind of world and find something representative and what you want to know. Great question, thank you. Uh, we've got another question on Twitter mm -hmm. um, from ODI Leeds, um, who have a crowd of people sat oh. watching the live stream. Hi, guys. Hi, hi Leeds. Um, have you found any specialists for opening old, unique storage systems? Um, digital ones. Um, I'm assuming not, actually, um, so although um, they haven't specified. So what was the question again, sorry? Have you found any specialists for opening old, unique storage systems? Specialists? Yeah, yeah, I've got loads of them. I've been accumulating them over the past few years, and they give me lots of advice on lots of sectors, from the police to the supermarkets. Um, yeah, usually people, and it, you know, uh, either people who are specialists in that, so you'd have archivists, librarians, and knowledge management people in, in companies and things like that. The, one, the people I, I really go to first are people who have degrees in, especially higher degrees in subjects like history, because they're just interested and they have thought about it a lot. And they usually, wow, you know, I, I have thought about that, but I hadn't got around to doing it. Why don't you try this? Go speak to this person, look at this, and that kind of thing. Um, because in this, in this world, you know, I could sit at the internet writing at every single thing, but I just, you know, just doing it personally works best more than anything else. Um, and finding someone's a bit of a history nerd is usually a really good start. Thanks, Leeds. Um, I have another question. So sure. uh, related to your, your point earlier, do you, have you ever come across data sets that you would like to recommend become open or you'd see the value directly of becoming open that you, you have either recommended or that you would like to? Um, let me think. Well, of ones that would, that, that would could be, be able open. to be open. Because, yeah. of course, you know, like the ODI could re retrospectively negotiate the release loads, loads of stuff, I'm sure, if, if you wanted to. Well, yeah. but, so we, we yeah. see data on a spectrum, so that's sure. kind of how we, we like to promote data being open within the context of some data 
that should shouldn't be open, sure. that should be shared in, in certain ways. Mm. But I was wondering if there are any that you think should be open. Yeah, um, the one which I've noticed looking at the various, listening to the various podcasts from these kinds of events, um, the data which people really like to focus on is economic data, um, which is great because everything's kind of economized now. Um, but I think more, not qualitative, statistical information, which is not um, money, would be really nice. How many things? So, because um, I know that the Resolution Foundation guys I've been working with, they, they've done a lot of stuff going, I think it was at the Office of, Na Office of National Statistics, they were telling me, where the, um, going back again to the 90s, you have to go into the one basement room they've got and look at the microfiche, because right? those things were always meant to be the future, right? They're not anymore. Um, and the microfiche, and then sort of sit down, type it all up. Um, so if the, oh yeah, here, to answer your question, if the ONS have got stuff they haven't digitized, but they've got it in that basement I've heard a lot about, that isn't necessary economic data, then that would be fantastic, please. Okay, thank you. Um, so unless there are any other questions. Oh, there's one more. Going from the title yep. which you present, the most successful long-term data storage is in undiscovered pharaoh's tombs in Egypt. Huh? But there was a problem in that the format uh, was not understood. It had to be decoded 200 years ago. Uh -huh. But that is by far the most successful long-term data storage project that's ever existed. Carve it in stone, guys. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, I, always print, I still print everything out. I scan all the things. I've got an online Dropbox system. It's all referenced and all this kind of stuff. Ser serious stuff I print out and put in a file. I've got loads of them in my office. You can come and look at them Monday. Yeah. Okay, one more question. We can type it. Sort of follow up to that, like, so what, what would you define as a successful storage format? Because, like, in your presentation, you talked about PDFs being successful, and I would argue every time I've used PDFs, they're, they kind of ruin the structure of data. They just, they, they're good for reading, so, like, if the, if, the, if the point is that you need to be able to retrieve that particular document, then they're great. If it's in terms of reading them into a machine and making them into structured data, they've, they've, they've failed at that massively. Mm -hmm. So what, what, I, what is the criteria for a, a good storage format? Um... In, I, I don't. Ha it would depend on whatever, whatever institution we're talking about, really. I suppose, wouldn't it? Um, and it also depends whatever project I'd be looking at, because they always want different things. Yeah. Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, the best thing to do is to just have lots of variety, because it means something will survive, which is the opposite of what probably everyone wants to hear. What you want to know is the one best way of doing it. Yeah. Um, actually, having a mixture. As the gentleman here mentioned, um, you know, like paper's really great because it survives hundreds of years. You just keep it in an attic, it's fantastic. Um, other things, like wood sticks that the medieval economy used to run on that they were burnt in the Victorian period, we don't know anymore. Um, so, I mean, from my perspective, longevity is the most, as long as I can read the thing and it lasts a long time, I'm happy to do a bit of the typing. Do you know what I mean? I don't mind if it's OCR'd. Because it's, that's there at all is most important to me. Um, other people would very much like the OCR thing very much because then you can use AI to do all, all that brain work I just said. Um, so I guess it depends on your target reading audience and what they would like from it. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think we've just about run out of time now. Uh, but please join me in thanking Michael. Thank you very much. Um, I have just forgotten what next week's lecture's on, but I'm going to ask Hannah to <laughs> remind us. Glamorous assistant. My glamorous assistant. Um, next week, we've got Zosia from Open Ownership here, and she's going to be talking about, she's going to be asking the question, can beneficial ownership data help curb corruption? So do come along to that if you can. Okay, thank you very much.